Hi there, I'm Todd Miller, 7-8 culinary arts teacher with Lakehead Public Schools. I've got another recipe for you to try today, but before we start, a few reminders. First off, if you're unsure about any of the equipment that you're going to be using, make sure you ask someone that has some more kitchen experience, especially when you're working around the stove, oven, and even the microwave. Make sure you understand how they work and always have a pair of oven mitts handy, even for the microwave, some of the equipment gets hot in there. If the recipe calls for the use of a knife, make sure that you're really comfortable using a sharp knife like this. Uh, again, ask somebody that has some experience and practice first before using it for your recipe. Always hold the knife with a lot of conviction in one hand and with your other hand, you wanna make sure that you keep your hand in that claw position, kind of like you're holding a tennis ball. Always keep your hand curled back so that the knife doesn't come in contact with your fingertips. Before you start the recipe, make sure you watch the entire video, read the recipe entirely through, make sure you understand everything, and of course, get all of your equipment and your ingredients out first. It makes the recipe go a lot more smoothly. And finally, don't forget, you made the mess, you're in charge of cleaning up. Don't leave a dirty kitchen for someone else. So have a great time cooking. Well, today we're going to take a look at a delicious dessert food that for some reason is often eaten for breakfast, and that's cinnamon buns. A great food. You can buy it, but it tastes so much better when you make it at home. We're going to take a look at a recipe today that allows you to make cinnamon buns from start to finish in only 90 minutes. So in an hour and a half, you can have great homemade tasting cinnamon buns. However, I'm going to show you a little bit of a twist on that to make your job a little bit easier, especially when it comes to the cleaning up part. So, for this recipe, oh and by the way, if you have not made anything else with these uh, cooking recipes uh, series that I've done, I, su I suggest that you go back to the Lincoln Public School website, YouTube website, and take a look at recipes like muffins or the chocolate chip cookie recipes. This is a little more involved as a recipe, so it might be good to just get used to using some of the other recipes first before you tackle this one. But if you want to take a go at it, you can do it. All right, so two bowls. We're going to be using a wet bowl and a dry bowl again, as always. In our wet bowl, we're going to start off with an egg. One egg today. And we add that first, just so that we can break up the egg a little bit before we add the other ingredients. So break this egg up, just get the yolk mixed in with the white a bit. And then we're going to be adding, for lots of flavor, some milk and some butter. Now, the milk needs to be heated up first. It has to be about 40 degrees Celsius, which is about the temperature of your body. And in that, we're going to melt some butter as well. So we start off with three quarters of a cup of milk. You want to warm that up, I suggest on the stove, but if you have a microwave and you just want to use that, uh, try about 30 or 40 seconds of the microwave and then test it with the thermometer or test it with your finger if you've got a nice clean finger. Then you can add your milk to that, uh, to your butter to that, excuse me, and the butter will also help to drop the temperature a little bit. Quarter cup of butter goes in and those two melt together and so now I've got some melted butter and some milk. You don't want it too, too hot, and I'll explain why in a bit. So I'm just going to take a quick temperature test of mine. And it is at 39 degrees. That's exactly where we want it. One of the reasons you don't want the milk too hot, because if you add it to your egg, it's going to actually start to cook your egg, and you're going to end up with scrambled egg in your cinnamon bun. And you don't want that. Add a little bit of water as well. You're going to add a quarter cup of water, just four tablespoons. And we're making a sweet dough, so we're going to add some sugar to the dough. There'll be lots of sugar in other areas today, but we're also going to make sure we get some in the dough as well, too. So a quarter of a cup, just smooth off the top using a knife, clean hands. And that sugar is going to dissolve in the liquid. It's a dry ingredient, but we're adding it to our wet ingredients just because it helps it to dissolve better. So those are our wet ingredients. Now we'll take a look at our dry ingredients. Now, if you look at the recipe card, the recipe calls for three and a quarter cups of flour. And this is a mistake I sometimes make when I'm uh, cooking, is that I just see the amount in the recipe and then I go and add it all right away. But often in recipes, you add uh, certain amounts of the same ingredient at different times. This is one of those occasions. So even though the recipe card says three and a quarter cup of flour, we're just going to start off with two and a quarter cup of flour. So, nice big scoop. Level off the top, one cup in, same thing. Best way actually is to use a spoon and put it into the 
one cut measurement and then level it off. I'm cheating a little bit, but I still think I get a pretty accurate measurement this way. And a quarter cup as well. Okay, so that's our first dry ingredient. We're also going to add a half of a teaspoon of salt. And we're going to be adding some yeast. Now, yeast we use a lot with bread products, and cinnamon buns are a good example of that. We're going to add two teaspoons of yeast. For those of you that don't know, yeast is a living organism. It's actually alive, and that's why it's good to keep it in the fridge in a dark container like this. It lasts much longer, and that's one of the reasons we don't want the water to be too hot. Yeast likes warm water, so we do want it warm, but if it's too hot, it actually kills the yeast. So that's why we don't want to go much above 40 degrees. So I just use a whisk to whisk those ingredients up. And now we're just simply going to mix our wets and our dries together. So I'll pour my wets in. I'm going to start off with the spatula to mix it up because I can get that good folding technique. And this is why we didn't add all of our flour at once. Even though the recipe calls for three and a quarter cup of flour, we're just adding two and a quarter cup because it's much easier at this point to get all of this stuff mixed up together. If you have a stand mixer or if you have a hand mixer that has dough hooks on it, you can use those instead of using these bowls. It is actually much easier. So if you've got those, you could just be turning on your stand mixer right now and it would be doing all of the work for you. So I've got this mixed together. It is a very wet, runny dough. Certainly not what we want at the end, but it's what we want right now. Nice and easy to mix up. So now I'm going to continue adding my last cup of flour to get to three and a quarter cups. I'm going to add one quarter at a time and mix them in. So a little flour and a good stir. We're looking finally for a dough that's just going to pull away nicely from the sides because we are going to be also working it on the countertop using a process called kneading. And so I add my first quarter cup in and I can see that it is starting to pull away from the side, but not quite. So I'm going to add another quarter cup. This seems a little tedious, but it just makes for a really nice soft dough at the end. You might not even add the entire full cup. If we're adding a quarter at a time, of course, we'll have to do that four times, but you might find after three times that you've got the dough to the point that you want it. Or, conversely, you might find that after adding a full cup of dough, a full cup of flour, excuse me, it's still not quite ready yet, and then you might need to add a little bit more. With this recipe, it really depends. It depends on the temperature outside of the day. It depends on the humidity. It, it depends on how accurately you were measuring your flour each time. Maybe I was a little off, and so it takes a little bit more. I think I'm going to have to switch to my fork now because it's getting a little bit harder, but I'll try to do this a bit. And the fork is just a bit easier to push the dough. And because it's metal too, it's a little stiffer. And I find that my dough, I've only added three of my quarter cup measurements, so that means three quarters of a cup. But my dough is nice and soft now, not too sticky, it's not really, really sticking to my hands. Still a little bit of dough in there, so I can probably just go ahead without adding that last quarter cup. So we've got the dough mixed nicely, but now we need to knead it. Kneading with a K in the front of the word. And that is where we work the dough a little bit to activate the gluten. The gluten is something in the flour, it's a protein, and we want to stretch those gluten strands out. So I take a little bit of flour in my hand, and I'm just going to lightly dust my countertop. This does make a bit of a mess. Just clean this up with a bit of dry paper towel first afterwards, and you'll be fine. Take my dough out. Get that bowl right out of the way, because you're going to need some room for that. And just move the dough around first a bit to get it coated with flour. And now, right now, it's a shaggy dough with lots of little bumps and pieces here. But as I start to knead it, and that kneading action, the traditional way, there's lots of fancy new ways of kneading now, but the traditional way is just pushing with the heel of your hand. And as you're pushing with the heel of your hand, helping to stretch out those gluten strands, then turning your dough a quarter turn and pulling it towards you. So stretch, turn, stretch, and turn. 
I can see I've got a little bit of dough sticking to the countertop. So if that happens, I'm going to add just a little bit more flour. It's another reason not to add any more than you need when it's in the bowl because you're going to add some as you're kneading and you don't want to make it over floured because then your dough gets very, very dry. As I'm stretching it out, I'm going to be making the dough much softer and then we'll let that dough rest for a little bit. So this is a great recipe to make for a family breakfast. But the problem is, is that you don't want to be getting up in the morning, getting all of these ingredients out, having to measure everything, get your dough ready, and then do all those dishes. So we're going to be soon getting to a point where you could make all of this, everything I'm doing right now, you can do the evening before, and then you can just let that sit overnight. And I'll show you in a few minutes what happens. That means that everything's cleaned up the night before and when you get up in the morning, all you have to do is cook them. So you have nice, fresh, warm cinnamon buns without having to spend the morning cleaning first. So you can see now the dough is not shaggy anymore. It's in a nice round sphere. It's nice and soft still. I'm just gonna form it in a bit of a circle here. And we're just gonna put that aside. You can cover it if you like. You don't have to cover it. Just put it aside for a little bit. We just want the dough to rest a little bit. So right now the gluten's been stretched out. The yeast is starting to eat the sugars that are in both the sugar and the flour itself. That's gonna help it to rise a bit. And we'll just let that rest for a second. While that's happening, we're now gonna prepare our filling because the, one of the best things about cinnamon rolls is the great filling inside. So we need a separate bowl for that. And our filling is gonna consist of three or four things brown sugar, butter, cinnamon of course, and possibly raisins. So let's start off with the brown sugar. We need one cup of brown sugar, and unlike when I was measuring my flour, when I was careful not to overpack it, with brown sugar you want it packed. So this is a half cup measurement, and you can see that it packed really well, and I have to do that two times. So it's quite a bit of sugar. We already have a quarter cup of sugar in the dough and now we're going to have a full cup of sugar in the filling as well. There's my second half cup. To that we're going to add some cinnamon. I forgot the cinnamon. How did you forget the most important ingredient? For our cinnamon we want a full tablespoon. Now my tablespoon spoon is too big to fit in here. So I'm going to use a teaspoon instead because I know that three teaspoons is the same as one tablespoon. A teaspoon is five milliliters and a tablespoon is a full 15 milliliters. So I'll just mix that up a bit so that the cinnamon mixes up nicely with the brown sugar. And then we're going to add some butter. I find watching students do this, this is a tricky part because we're going to be spreading this on after. And the butter really needs to be really, really soft. For most students, it often makes sense to almost melt the butter, to put it in the microwave for about 20 seconds so it's so soft that it's almost liquidy. But the problem is, if you melt it completely and it is just liquid, then your filling is just going to slide all over the place on top of your dough. So what I did was I put my butter on top of the stove. I just have the stove on just low, and now it's mostly melted. There's still some good chunks in there, but it's mostly melted, which will just make it a bit easier to stir. So that was half of a cup of butter, which is the same as 115 grams if you have a scale at home. So now as I stir this mixture together, I'm going to have a nice thick mixture. It can even be a bit thicker than this. It just makes it a little bit harder to spread onto your, onto your dough. But I find for the first few times anyways, that that's a little bit easier for most people. So that's a nice thick mixture there. It's gonna be pretty easy to spread. It can be a bit thicker, like I said, if you want, but that's close enough. All right, so it'd be great if you can let your dough rest for about 10 to 15 minutes. So I've got that ready while I was resting. I should really wait a little bit longer, but this is YouTube, so we have gotta keep the show going. So now I'm gonna add a little bit more flour and I'm going to put my dough on there and now we're going to roll it up. For that we need a rolling pin. All 
all lots of different kinds out there. And we're just gently going to roll the dough a bit. And I suggest after rolling it a bit, turning it over so you get flour on both sides. And then we're really going to roll this out. We want a dough that's about half a meter or 50 centimeters long and 30 centimeters wide. So if you think of a ruler that you use at school, that's a 30 centimeter ruler. So we want our dough to be as wide as a 30 centimeter ruler, but we want it to be almost twice as long. And the reason for this is this allows for a nice big surface to put our filling on. Now the dough should be soft enough that if you need to, you can flip the whole thing over, which this dough does. So we get a nice big surface area to work with. All right, so that's pretty good. I know it's by my eye. If you have a ruler, you can use that, but I know by my eye, it's about 30 centimeters by 50 centimeters. Nice big surface that we're now gonna put our filling on. And this is why it helps if the filling's not too, too thick. Because if you take that filling and you spread it out gently, you can see that if it was really, really thick because of the butter, if the butter was uh, much less melted, it'd be much harder to spread out. You can use a spoon like this, or you can use a spatula. I usually end up starting with the spoon and then finishing up with the spatula. Something else to remember as you're spreading it out is to make sure that you don't go too close to the edge. I like to tell students that kind of thinking about making a pizza. And when you make your pizza, you put your sauce on first and we don't want the sauce to spill off the side. So we do not put the sauce right to the edge. A centimeter or two away from the edge helps to keep it from leaking out and it'll help us after when we seal up our dough. Nice and easy to spread, but yet it's not completely liquidy and therefore not falling off. So now it comes to the big decision, the raisins. Now, a hundred years ago when I was a kid, everyone seemed to like raisins. It was even something you got at Halloween often in little boxes. These days I find working with students that people have very strong opinions, either for raisins or anti-raisins. So there's a couple of ways to do this. If everyone in your family hates raisins, don't bother putting any on. If everyone loves raisins, that's great put them on. If only some people like raisins, well, we can just take some raisins, about half a cup for the whole thing, so in this case about a quarter cup, and I'm just putting it on one side. If I did the whole side, I'd use about half a cup, but I'm just putting it on one side. So there's the raisins. Now cinnamon rolls, we need to roll it up. So we're going to take our thumbs, and we're going to start at one end closest to us, and we're just going to roll it over. And I'm going to go all the way down, and keep rolling. When I get to the end, I'm going to roll back. Nice and tight. We want lots and lots of circles here. And I'm going to end up with a one long piece of dough. And the nice thing was, not too sticky, so I was able to roll it easily. Then we end up with a long tube like this. So now we've got this long tube of dough, and we're going to pinch the seam. That means that there's this seam here where it's all kind of loose and I just kind of pinch it over with my fingers, go all the way along. This also helps to keep some of the cinnamon from, and our butter and our brown sugar from coming out. I also pinch the ends, roll them in a bit. Pinch this end as well. There we go. So now we have to turn this long tube into our cinnamon rolls. And this is how we're going to do it. Cutting board is essential for me because this is a wood countertop or a regular countertop. And we're going to divide this into 12 equal pieces. Best to use a serrated knife, the one that's got the little ridges on it for this, because we want to do cuts like a sawing action. We don't want to press down like we would with a regular chef's knife. Now we want to divide this into 12 equal pieces because we're going to be putting that in the baking dish after. However, if I just started at the end and trying to divide this into 12 pieces, it's very difficult to do. So we're going to do a little bit of math. I know that half of 12 is 6. So it's easier to see where about the halfway point is, and you can measure it too if you want. 
So I know now that I'm only going to be cutting up into six pieces. I could still try to cut six here, or again, I could cut it in half. And now that I know I've got two halves here and I want to get six out of that, that means each half has to give me three. Now it's a little bit easier to see how I could divide this into thirds. And notice as I'm cutting, I'm sawing down very gently so that I get my three pieces. And then I just repeat the process. I know I can get three more, oops, we'll tighten it over there, out of this one. You can see the nice swirl pattern in there because of the rolling. There's lots of cinnamon uh, and brown sugar spread throughout the whole cinnamon bun that way. Do the same thing with the other side. Start off with my next cut to have three, and then cut those into thirds as well. So I'm going to end up with 12 pieces all together. There we go. 12 pieces cutting with that serrated knife. So now we have to put these into a pan. Now there's lots of butter and stuff in this already, but I still like to spray the pan. I want these things to come out nice and easy after. So a coat of butter or a good spray is really important. There's 12 of them, so we're going to make th uh, four rows with three in each row. So again, we've got our great swirl. That swirl, we want to be at the bottom and at the top. So we're gonna put them not down on their side like this, but so that we can see the swirl from the top. So there's my first row, my second row, my third row, and I just have to move this guy over for my fourth row. There. And so now I've got four rows, three in each row. I have all my ones with raisins on one side of the pan and all the ones without on the other side. Now, like I said before, this would be great to be able to make the night before because then we wouldn't have all this to clean up in the morning. So this would be the point where I would stop. If I wanted to make these the night before, I would then just take some plastic wrap, cover it with some plastic wrap, and we're gonna put it in the fridge, cold room if you have to have one, something at around five to 10 degrees, but if you don't, the fridge is absolutely fine and just gonna put those in overnight. They are going to rise. If you put them in the fridge, they'll rise a little bit. If you put them in a cold room, they'll, they'll rise quite a bit. In fact, I made some last night and these have been resting overnight. And you can see how much they've risen, how nice and fluffy and soft they are. And that's gonna make a better tasting cinnamon bun. So besides the cleaning up part, it's better to make them the night before because then they're much softer because they had all night to rise. So that's one way of doing it, or if you're a little more pressed for time, you want to eat them right now, we'll still cover them with the plastic wrap, leave them aside for about 30 minutes, and then you'll be able to pop them in the oven. So I'm going to let these rest for 30 minutes now. I'm going to let my oven preheat during that time. We want the oven at 375 degrees, so that after the 30 minutes, they'll be, I know that the oven will be at the exact right temperature, and then we're going to bake them for about 20 minutes. We'll take a look at them after they're baked. Okay, so our cinnamon buns rested for 30 minutes, then they went into the 373 degree oven, 20, 25 minutes, depends again on your oven. These ones took 22 minutes today. And you can see how beautiful they look now, how the cinnamon and the sugar and the butter have oozed out of the top how nice and big and puffy they are. They take up the entire tray. They're fantastic. Now you can serve them like this, but there's a lot of cinnamon and butter and sugar at the bottom of the pan that you probably won't get at. So another way of doing it is like this. First off, let them cool down five or 10 minutes first, and I have let them cool down already. So cool that I can touch the rack, but you don't want to leave them for too long. And then take a cookie sheet, Put it upside down and then really quickly, confidently, you know you can do this, you're going to flip the whole thing over. Now, we're just going to let that sit for a moment and gravity should help us out 
by getting some of those cinnamon buns to fall out. If you wait too long, they'll get stuck there. If you do it too soon, it's too hot still, all of that cinnamon, butter, and brown sugar will just ooze all over the place. Now these are the ones that I made before and when I took them out I put re-inverted them so this is the original side that they were baked in. So they're great to serve just like this you just pull off the piece that you want they're fantastic nice and warm but you can take it one step further if you want. This is good to go you can eat these the way they are but if you really want to take it to the next level you can make a glaze some icing, icing to put on top of this as well. And for that, we'll need another kind of sugar. We used granular sugar in the dough, we used brown sugar in our filling, and now we're going to use icing sugar. Very light, powdery sugar. One cup of icing sugar. Now, it is, if you have one of these called a sifter, it's great to use. Icing sugar tends to clump. There's big clumps of icing sugar uh, left over in that sieve right now, and I just lost one, there it is. You don't really want that in your icing, it'll make it really, uh, it'll make it kind of almost too sweet when you bite into it. So it's best if you can sift that first. So I've sifted one cup of icing sugar already. A little bit of flavor from vanilla. One teaspoon of vanilla. And we're just going to give that a bit of a whisk. Just to sort of mix in that vanilla a little bit. And then we're going to add some milk. Now the recipe calls for one to two tablespoons. That's because it depends on the consistency that you want. You don't need much. I'm going to start off by putting about one tablespoon in and giving that a good stir with my whisk. Oh, lost a little bit. Already I can see, oh, I lost some more. <laughs> that it's nice and thick. It mixes very, very quickly and you get a nice sort of consistency. Maybe I find this a little bit too thick, so I could add a little bit more, maybe another, another teaspoon. It is amazing how little milk it takes so to switch from being really, really thick to being too thin. If you find that your uh, icing sugar is, your icing is too thin, you can just add a little bit more icing sugar if you need to. But what I'm looking for is I want it to be able to drizzle off of the whisk in a nice even way and that looks pretty good like that. There we go. So there's some icing sugar. If you want to put it on top you can. I lift the top off of this. There we go. They all came out. Most of the filling has gone from the bottom of the pan. It's on top of my delicious cinnamon rolls instead. They look beautiful like this. You can flip them over again to the way they were when they baked but they look just great like this. And then just take a fork, or even the whisk that you were using before, get some of the icing on your fork, and we're just going to shake it around on top of the pan. And you're going to get that beautiful icing on there. Again, you need to wait for it to be cool. If you put this on while the cinnamon buns are still really, really hot, the icing is just going to melt right off. So we do want it to be a bit cooler than that. And you can put as little or as much as you want on there. The icing that I gave you, the one cup of icing sugar with the milk and the vanilla, is enough easily to glaze these 12 cinnamon buns with a little bit left over as well. So now we've got a beautiful cinnamon bun with a little bit of glaze on top. You've got all of that butter and brown sugar because we inverted it. These are fantastic, warm, great the day that they're made. And honestly, they probably won't much last much longer than that. You can see the place is already cleaned up. This is what it would look like if I had made everything the night before and all I had to do was cook them in the morning. So I've got very little to clean up the next day. So enjoy these fantastic cinnamon buns and happy cooking.